Ladies and gentlemen, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce you to Jared Bibler and his book, 2021 book, Iceland Secret. The title is not overwrought. It is truly a secret. There's something that happened in Iceland that we don't know about. It is revealed in this fantastic book. Jared was in the thick of it. He joined the regulator after the wipeout. So the 2007 to 2009 global financial crisis, we all experienced it. It was miserable, but perhaps it was more miserable in Iceland than in any other country in the world. Actual Great Depression-like events took place. Bank accounts wiped out. Bank accounts closed down and unavailable. Capital controls that lasted until 2017. Bankruptcies left and right. Everyone declared, everyone, everyone declared bankruptcy. Everyone, you know, quote unquote, lost their house, lost their business, lost their car, jobs. It was a disaster true financial disaster. Jared was there. Jared had come from the United States, came before the bust, joined the financial regular investigating crimes that took place, and he writes about it in this book. But the key, and this is something Jared makes plain in the book and in the interview, it's not just about Iceland. It's about the financial system writ large, and it's not just about the global financial crisis, which is in the past. It's taking place right now. And ladies and gentlemen, the title, Iceland Secret, which by the way, check the show notes. You can purchase the book. You'll find where you can go and find the book, where you can buy it. It's not, there is a secret. There is a secret. We know only part of the story, what was carried in the headlines, but there's so much more. Stick around after the interview and I'll share a bit of personal news. I mean, I can reveal especially that the book is not especially popular in Iceland. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I get really nice, I do get really nice messages from Icelandic readers. You know, they reach out to me on social media and uh, they say, wow, you really, you really, you really did it. It's really good. But among Icelandic elites, um, there's been no, you know, there's been, there's been no recognition of this. It, it's not a, it, it's all true, but it's not a particularly popular story i think people wanted to just get past this um as you see in the book well let's talk about it okay let me introduce right. myself my name's yeah. emil kalinowski this is euro dollar university i'm with jared bibbler but jared did i pronounce your last name correctly yes yeah yep. that's show right started. yep and we're going to be talking about your book jared which came out in 2021 and it's called icelandic <laughs> iceland secret and I loved it. I was on a flight to Iceland. I was reading it in Iceland and it was fantastic. I highly recommend it to the audience uh, for three reasons. One, the title is not an overwrought title. There really is a secret. Two thirds of the way through the book, the story goes in a direction that I wasn't expecting, maybe because I'm naive, maybe. <laughs> I was naive too. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. The second reason is because it's ed educational, informative book. So something happened in Iceland during the global financial crisis, Con perhaps continued. So that's it's important to know what happened there. We've heard bits and bits of the bits and pieces of the story, and then the third reason is because it's a very personal story. I love that, and I'm going to commit a cardinal sin of interviewing authors, and that's. To mention someone else's book other than yours oh, that's but it fine. reminded me of daniel de martino's book from a few years ago called fed up she talked about uh -huh. her experience at the federal reserve but it wasn't dry Ugh, what did i do in the morning what spreadsheets did i calculate what did the governors think and how do they act it was she right. intertwined her own personal story and you wanted to find out both what was happening on the inside as well as what was happening with her and her personal life. 
And that was the same thing with you. I really enjoyed it. And you grabbed our attention right from the beginning, Jared. I couldn't believe, tell people how you got to Iceland, the catastrophe that took place. And then at the beginning of your story, you hook us by telling us the kind of food you've been driven to eat. Do you remember <laughs> what yes. you tell us? This I, I was from the, yeah, go ahead. When Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle, he said, I think he said <laughs> something like, I was aiming for America's heart and I hit it in the stomach because he was trying to change like labor policy, but he talks about how the sausage was made literally and how like a little boy fell asleep. And anyway, it wasn't that bad, but but every interviewer so far has asked me this question. I, so this, really? This, really gr this really grabs people, this one detail, which is just one sentence in the book, right? But we, um, after the crisis, when the crisis hit, uh, I'd been living in Iceland for four years at that point, and, and the life there is really nice. It's really, really wonderful. And so for me, it was just like my mom said, oh, you're already retired. It was like a per permanent vacation. It was so nice. Um, work hours were not too bad. And uh, like I say in the book, uh, uh, like we were talking about offline before, I was going swimming every day in these geothermal pools. I mean, it's a wonderful life. And then when the crisis came, suddenly things just snapped and... You know, the supermarket shelves were, were, were going bare. The Gordon Brown regime <laughs> in Britain declared Iceland as a terrorist state in order, in order to freeze payments. I mean, things really got bad. Um, and, and we were uh, trying, my partner and I were trying to, um, to economize because we didn't, have, um, we, we didn't have the incomes that we'd had and so on. And I went to the farmer's market which is called Kola Portif. It's also a flea market, downtown Reykjavik. And I was just looking like, oh, what can I buy? And um, I found this this beautiful package of like sausage. It's quite big and it was quite cheap. It was like, I don't know, it was like four bucks or something for this big. It was like a lot of sausage. And I was like, oh, this, this is something we can try. <laughs> so I brought that home and she said, oh, you got this. This is like called Hrossabjugr, which means like, horse sausage and it's like made from horses and it's um it's it's not very good <laughs> you know it's, it's very smoky and there's huge pieces of fat and basically you boil it uh you boil it in a pot and you make some like mashed potatoes and you eat eat, eat that um but it was just it was kind of like it, it was the marker that we had like i felt like we had hit the bottom of the barrel when when that happened yeah lobules of fat yeah, they're That's pretty how you big. Described it, we're coming like, out of the sausage. Probably bigger Which than the I end love. of your thumb, you know. Oh, well, maybe you'd I like it. You should. I try love it next sausage. Time. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if anyone's going to cut that out and put that on a drop out of context <laughs> on on social media. But I love love sausage. But right. Yes. When I read that, that I turned my stomach. Tell people you you worked in finance um, in the United States. Yeah. You had expertise in software, maybe yeah. back office, yeah, yeah, yeah. management of financial systems. Yeah. You fell in love with Iceland. You wanted to move there. Tell people just a little bit about your background in financial history. And then I think we're underplaying the depths of the crisis in yeah, Iceland can... because everyone understands what happened in their country, country the GFC. Right. But yeah. Iceland, it was Great Depression style. Yes. Depression. Yes. Yes. Bank wipeout, savings yes. disappearing. So, yeah. Okay. Tell us I, how you got I'll, there. Sure. Well, I worked um, after college. I worked for about five years in a small consulting firm in Boston, and we uh, we were building the back office for one of the biggest Wall Street banks and rolling it out globally. So, I got to know all these ins crazy things about how Japanese Japanese stocks settle and. Um, I did a lot of work actually on mortgage-backed securities in, in, in the run-up to that boom in, in, in the New York market. Even even someone in that bank told me that mortgage backs were going to bring down the bank one day. I mean, he, he said that in like 2002, 2003, maybe. So, and I, I didn't believe him, but he, of course he was right. So, so that was my background, but it was quite intense. I mean, I was working maybe 12-hour days and weekends and everything for a few years to roll out that system. I got kind of burned out. And I stumbled into on a on a rare vacation. I stumbled into a chance to work in Iceland, um, doing something similar, but for much much smaller banks, much much smaller um, 
economy. So I, I said, well, I'll just try this for a year. You know, the the big bank in New York, they they were happy to have me back any time. So I thought, well, I'll just try this. I'll just go to Iceland for a year and see how it is and tr try to see a new society. And I just, I, as I already said, I loved it there. And so I lived there a few years. But during that time, the Icelandic banks grew. They were doubling in size. Their balance sheets were doubling roughly every year for several years. They had been really sleepy. I mean, Iceland only has, at, at the time, it only had, I think, 285,000 people when I moved there, the whole country. So, I mean, that that population needs banks and especially they need banks to fund um, fishing which is a huge huge industry and they need banks to fund agriculture and, and, and business so there's kind of three banks one one almost for each of those um, sectors but these banks were not very big and the Icelandic currency was not exchangeable outside Iceland so you could go there as a tourist but they had very few tourists in those days you go as a tourist you could buy Icelandic krona you know, but when you left in the airport, you could exchange it back. But you, if, if you forgot to do that, <laughs> nobody knew what it was outside outside of the country. So a couple of changes were made in the early 2000s, which was privatizing the banks um, and uh, and freeing the currency so that it could be bought and sold everywhere like a like a like a regular FX cross. So that led to a lot of interest in Iceland because Iceland had high yields. So it had high yielding bonds. And at that time, the Greenspan Fed had yields down at, you know, the overnight rate was down at like 1% or something, I think, um, after the dot-com crash that was pre-GFC. That was the bubble that built the GFC. Anyway, so people people wanted these Icelandic government bonds that would pay 8 or 10% or more. Um, and so money was just flooding into the country. And these, these little banks <laughs> that you never heard of were suddenly able to double. And if you double in size every year for four or five years, I mean, you become, you take over the world, right? It's this exponential growth. They each grew to be the size roughly of Enron. So three Enrons. I know that's pretty old, uh, pretty old news now, but I still think Enron's very important. Um, but when Enron collapsed, it was the seventh biggest company in the US. I think seventh big, biggest listed company in the US. And it was a huge story. But Iceland has 1,000 times fewer people than the U.S. And we had three Enrons go bust in one week um, in early 2008. And when that happened, it was just catastrophic um, for us living there. I mean, personally, we ended up losing our house. Uh, we didn't. We had an old car, so we didn't lose the car. But most people also lost their car. Um, and in Iceland, there's not really good transportation system, so you need a car. Um, it was just devastating. The the inflation was was through the roof because w one of the one of the pressure release valves for the country for an economy like that when you have financial trouble is the currency. So the currency immediately dropped in value. Um, it lost half of its value, and then it was just frozen. Nobody was even trading it. Um, so when that happens, when your currency loses half of its value, everything you import. Is basically double the price so you can imagine the inflation the inflation was was crazy at the same time we had the high inflation we also had a, a, a collapse in the job market so unemployment went up by 500 600 percent in just like a month um and you know it was just it was and like i already said you know supermarket shelves are going bare and a lot of us had our savings in money market funds because we were greedy like everybody else um savings ac accounts paid like only i don't know these are rough numbers let's say only 10 11 percent <laughs> <laughs> but but the money market was paying like 15. so it was like oh well, i'll just get the 15. but what we didn't know was the money market was not really invested in anything too good um and so and so when everything collapsed also our withdrawals from the money market funds were frozen so that meant we had no, really no access to our cash. I mean, I had a little bit of cash in my, um, in, in my, like the equivalent of like a US checking account, my debit card account. I had maybe, I don't know, one or $2,000 worth in there. And that was, but that was it. And I had all my other savings in the money market fund because we, we wanted, foolishly, we wanted to buy a bigger house. I'm glad we didn't do that. But, but we had, we had this cash, which, which was then frozen. And by the time we got it out, in real terms, we had lost about seventy-five percent on the on the um, on the cash, just the cash. And if you were invested in the Icelandic stock market and the broad index, I think you lost ninety-seven percent in two thousand eight. Of so the market just 
The market just disappeared, really. There wasn't a market after that. Astounding. Absolute wipeout. And an inavailability of cash. Unbelievable. Uh, and p personal bankruptcies. When I was in uh, Iceland, I was talking to one of the people there that we met, and he told me how he lost two of his businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone was declaring bankruptcy. One of the reasons why was because the mortgages were linked to inflation. Oh, yeah, that's right? They would reset variable... Uh, variable adjustable mortgages. They, they reset. Well, Go ahead, what tell us? So, <laughs> I've actually never done. So, I'm, I've never delved into the mechanics of this because I was so disgust. I should know it. But basically, what you have is you have a. You, you have an interest rate on the mortgage, like five percent. But on top of that, so you pay that. But whatever inflation, so whatever the CPI did, let's say in the past month that gets tacked on to your principal balance. So, uh, so your principal's always going up. And when you have really crazy inflation, like we had during the crisis year, then um, our principal balance went, I don't know, let's, these are rough numbers, but imagine if you had a, if you had a mortgage for, um, I don't know, $300,000. And then suddenly it was the principal balance was five hundred thousand dollars and then the month and at the same time you've lost your job yeah. <laughs> and you don't have access to cash right and and the and monthly the, pay would have, yeah, the monthly ahead. payment they adjust as well to to match that that's the part i don't fully understand because there's there were different flavors of these there's some where the monthly payment adjusted one way and some adjusted another way but basically you end up just screwed in the system and by the way i don't believe they've changed this since so i think this is still this is still running basically the same way so catastrophic losses for the entire country and in part that you made clear in the book which i didn't know at the time was that iceland for much of the 20th century was one of europe's poorest countries it had absolutely nothing and it yep. seemingly exploded into this financial giant <laughs> was it condition international conditions or people were conflating Iceland. Oh, look, it's just another Scandinavian country, Sweden, Norway. Right. We, we trust them. We trust Denmark, Finland. Right. We look askance at it. Okay. But maybe Iceland is like those <laughs> other countries and they've opened up their currency. The banks mm -hmm. are growing. The mm -hmm. stock market's growing. Yep. Of course, you tell us why those banks are growing. But okay. Yep. So what? why, why the surge into Iceland, just a new opportunity within a bubblish uh, well, economic context? I, well, there's two things here. So Iceland was founded, the first parliament in Iceland met in the year 930, not 1930, but 930. And Iceland has a very old tradition of quasi-representative government and uh, freedom from a king and so on. So the country was, was settled starting in 874 and, and had, a, had a sort of a glory time called the Commonwealth for several hundred years around the year 1000. And so, and, and, and Iceland wrote the first uh, prose literature in, in, in the Western canon, which are the Icelandic sagas. So it's a very proud place. And then uh, it had many, many hard, hard centuries, but that pride is there and it's, it's ready to be activated. Um, and so, so when things, this is my impression as an outsider, but now a naturalized Icelander as well. But when things were starting to go well, um, people said, this is it. We've been waiting for this for a thousand years. And now we got what we deserve. So the population was very happy to see this economic boom. There, there wasn't much questioning of it. Uh, and I moved there in 2004, which was kind of right as it was starting to take off. And um, I, th that's not entirely true. Some, some people were questioning it, but, but by and large, it was rah-rah. And l like you kind of hinted, um, the, the so the countries close to Iceland, the uh, the Nord the other Nordics, they kind of look at Iceland as the strange little brother, or the <laughs> the wild the cousin who moved to the wild west or something like that. They they are a little bit um, careful with Iceland, um, and so I don't believe any of the Nordic banks had any real exposure uh, when Iceland crashed. 
But the people who romanticize, I mean, Americans rom seem to romanticize Iceland now, especially with the tourist boom. But I think, um, like the Germans, for example, and now I live in Switzerland, um, in German-speaking cultures, Iceland is the pure land of the north. It's, you know, <laughs> even in Greek mythology, there was a Thule, I think this was Greek, this Thule, anyway, which is, which is the far, the furthest north land. It's kind of a mythical place. And, you know, you had um, Wagner writes the, the Ring Cycle. This is based on um, uh, Nordic mythology, which is really Icelandic mythology. It was Iceland who wrote down these, what we call Nordic myths. So there is, there on the mainland of Europe, the, there was a lot of money ready to <laughs> to go to Iceland. So a lot of German Landesbanks, these are the the banks of the of, of the regions of Germany, they were exposed, for example, um, because the impression in these countries is that Iceland is a, um, a very pure and, 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 and civilized and wonderful place. I mean, which it is on a personal level. So on a, on a human development level, it's arguably the most developed country in the world. But on an economic development level, it's um, it has a lot. It, it's more. It operates more like uh, to quote one of my best friends um, who is who's a Brazilian Icelandic and also American he's got three passports but he says Iceland is the furthest north of the Latin American countries <laughs> 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 because economically you have you have high inflation periods um, you have it, high interest it, okay. rates you have a kind of a iffy currency um, <laughs> and you know you like imagine this you have an economy that's built today on tourism fishing um, and, and, and some exports of aluminum, right? Mm -hmm. If you go to a German bank and you say, I'm from an island of 300, and, now it's 360,000, I think. I'm from an island of 360,000, you know, in the Caribbean, and we, these are our industries, you know, would you lend to us? They would say, no way. But if you come from Iceland and say this, people, oh, well, yeah, sure, you know? So there's a kind of a, I don't know, reverse racism or, or however you want to say that, but, but, there, but it benefits from its mythological status probably disproportionately. Yeah. Well, I was there and I was witnessing it. It is romantic there. I would lend them money as well. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's lovely. The I Vikings, love it. And plus there's some sort of threat uh, in the background that they'll maybe come ashore and sack your village. Everyone's <laughs> yes. tough there. All the women are yes. six feet tall and blonde. All the men are even taller. So yeah, maybe it's best to give them your money. One more question before we turn to kind of part two of the book, because you're going to become an investigator. You're going to become an investigator for the regulator, the Icelandic regulator. Incredible. What great fortune. And that's what gave you the opportunity to dive in face first into these books and find out what actually happened. But before I go there, I'm going to commit another cardinal sin, but hopefully this time you won't hold it against me as much. But I'm thinking of another book. This one of our mutual acquaintance, Russell Napier, mm -hmm. you arrived in 2004, and it reminds me of this of the moment when Russell arrived in Southeast Asia in yes. 95, 96, and That's he right. makes the point that he arrives not when the party began, but already when people were a bit inebriated, and you walk <laughs> into the room, <laughs> That's right. and you can see people are inebriated, and it's it's a it's it's happening it's a little bit fast here but that's because he walked in sober when you arrived in iceland did you, you arrive sober did you look around and think to yourself wait a minute this mm -hmm. is a little bit there's a, been a few too many drinks here and the people don't realize that they've yeah. had too many financial drinks that's really cool that you made this parallel with russell's book um i hadn't seen that i hadn't thought i've read his book too I hadn't thought of that, but it's kind of true um, because I was uh, coming out of, you know, I had been through the dot-com bust in the U.S. and I was reading the book, one of my favorite books to drop another uh, favorite author, but Bethany McLean, she wrote uh, The Smartest Guys in the Room about Enron, mm -hmm. which is just, I love this book. And I was reading that in the early days in Iceland because the book had just <laughs> come out. And I'm looking all around me and I'm seeing kind of the Enron story, but like on a national scale, I couldn't figure out where the money was coming from to do, like there, there was a huge real estate boom in Iceland. And by, by the end of the, 
uh, by the end of the, the, the boom years, there were, there were more Range Rovers sold in Iceland than in all the other Nordic countries put together, which have much, 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 much bigger populations. And, but even in the early days, I was living uh, in Vesterbayer, which is the west end of Reykjavik, and that's on the approach path to the Reykjavik city airport. So not, not where you flew in, but there's a smaller airport, but that's also the private jet airport because it's right next to the city center. So I would see just private jet after private jet and um, in, 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 in what's effectively like a New England fishing village. I mean, you're just in a really small little town, cute, beautiful city, miniature city. But, um, but seeing like a few private jets in an hour coming into the airport was just really weird. And I asked my friends, like, I asked my friends at work, like, why are there so many private jets? And they, they said, um, but what? I mean, you're from America. Like, you, you must have, I was, I, I've never seen this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, um, and they said, yeah, but you're from Boston. I said, yeah, but I've maybe seen a private jet, like, taxiing at, at Logan Airport or something, but I never just see them every day coming into a, a much smaller place. So yeah, there, there were signs. And the other sign was just the stock market. It was going up 50 or 60% a year in those years. And so people didn't even want to talk about an investment that went up 20%. <laughs> we all thought it was normal back then, right? Then 1990s had just finished. Stock markets were supposed to go up 20 to 30%. And if you're in Iceland, it's a little riskier. 50% seems <laughs> right. normal. Sure, we had a little downturn. Right. But now we're back to that boom time again, or not even boom time, it's as it should be. So it was easy yes, to as it should be. Yep. to explain away. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All of a sudden, miracle, you get a job. <laughs> it was a miracle. At the, fi at the financial regulator. Yeah. And yeah, please tell people what, what was happening there. But the what I remember was that one day you were asked to peek under the corner of this rug and see if there was anything there. Not not literally, but you know, there's right. something underneath the, that was swept underneath the rug. Can you take a peek under this corner? And eventually as the story goes, you keep lifting the rug higher mm. and higher, <laughs> further and further yes. back into time. I like this. And you're astounded. You're lifting the whole rug above your head here. The lights went out while we're recording. <laughs> it's so yeah. early. Uh, go ahead and tell the people what you were you asked to do Mm -hmm. And uh, you started unraveling the, the, the crime that mm. took place. Mm. Well, I want to say as a disclaimer that the book is, of course, everything is factual in the book, and it's but it's my personal story. Like you said, there may be many more angles to this story that we don't know, and I I know that there are actually, but this to me is one of the crimes that that certainly underpins the the boom years in Iceland. Um, and it, it, it and I really want people to understand it because I think it's, you know, the book is the book is about Iceland, but it's also not about Iceland, and um, Iceland is kind of a a petri dish where you could see things that are happening in bigger places more easily because it's a smaller smaller society, but it still has all the trap, still has a stock exchange, it still has banks, it still has all the things that other Western all that all countries have. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I I got very lucky because. The, the unemployment rate was, was through the roof. Um, and um, I had actually been working in one of those banks and I quit. My last day was Friday, mm -hmm. October 3rd. And all the banks collapsed the, the following Monday, Tuesday and Thursday, I think. So um, I, I just got out by the skin of my teeth. I think and, and I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but for the audience, we're not going to be able to go over every detail in the yeah, book, yeah. of course, but there's a, there's a whole section about your experience at those banks and why you left and it's so important yeah we won't get to it here no. but again I, I urge the audience to uh yeah there's get the book to find out those are some good stories there i think um yeah the the, the things that happen at the banks um uh i also put in the book because they're also things that happen at every bank but it was my first time seeing them but i think they happen in some form everywhere but some of the stories are kind of crazy. Anyway, I leave that for the reader. Um, yeah, so we had this dark winter, and in Iceland, the winter is very dark. Um, we get about maybe one or two hours of, of a little bit of gray light each day, and then that's the day. Then you have another 22 hours of, <laughs> of dark. Um, 
But this dark, dark winter, and then I got hired in the spring by the financial regulator called FME. They wanted, um, they wanted someone to, they wanted one additional investigator because they didn't really have an investigation team. They wanted one additional investigator to look at some of the new cases that were coming up out of the crisis. And they actually hired two of us. And, um, and I did, you know, I came in and, and it was just an empty desk and uh, some binders and, uh, you know, like a, like a Dell PC and some, you know, it was like a phone and that was it. And they said, you know, um, well, good luck, <laughs> go investigate the crisis. Um, and uh, I got lucky because early on, within a week or two, one of the lawyers came over uh, from our team and he said, hey, Jared, do you have some time? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I have nothing but time. <laughs> um, <laughs> he said, could you look at this letter? And it was a, it was a letter from the Icelandic Stock Exchange. And uh, it was just a peek, like you say, a peek under the rug. But what they said was that um, they had noticed strange trading behavior in the three days, those three days before the banks collapsed in October 2008. So as the financial crisis was really ripping around the world, they noticed that the banks, there was one trader at each bank um, who basically bought almost 100% of the day's volume on the Icelandic exchange. It would be just one trader ID. And they just wanted to alert the regulator about this. And they sent that letter, I think, in January of 2009. So it was already a few months later. And now I'm starting in April 2009. So it's even six six months after the crisis started. Um, and this letter has just been sort of languishing. You know, they, they didn't have enough. Uh, I, I don't want to pick on these people. I mean, people were doing their best. But we had a, a regulator with about 35 staff total. That includes the secretaries. That includes, you know, everybody, the IT people. Everybody it was 35 people. And we had three collapsed Enrons to look into. And plus they had the daily business of regulating the insurance market, the investment funds, and all the other things that the regulator does. So there were many, many things like this letter that probably even never got saw the light of day. But I kind of latched onto this because, like I said, I had, I had done a lot of work in trading and settlement. And so this was something I knew that I knew about. I felt confident about it. And so oh, I'll, I'll take a look at this. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I got the trading data from the exchange and um, for those three days. And it was crazy because it was like, is this all the trades? Because every trade, the buyer ID was um, was was one of three people at each bank, and they were only interested in the shares in their own bank, n nothing else. And we were able to confirm pretty quickly that these were guys that were that were proprietary traders. So these were guys that were using the bank's money to buy the shares. But the volume was crazy. It was like every trade in those three days this 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 person was the buyer for every trade <laughs> and it was just such obvious market abuse i was like you know well i said okay well we have a case here we have three cases here so let me just um make sure that it's only these three days you know and then we can write this up and these will be my first cases wow you know cool and there was a new special prosecutor's office he was very keen to get these type of things and the icelandic public i didn't mention this yet but the public was was livid for those six months because when you lose your you know when you lose your even ability to buy food in some cases people and you're in a democracy people go out on the streets and and people were really angry um, uh, demanding new elections uh, for parliament and so on and so there was a big public push in the in that first year to like you know who's to blame for my lost life, my lost savings, my lost pension. Um, so I felt that energy behind me. Um, and I said, Okay, I just want to I just want to see make sure that um, it's just these three days. <laughs> so I called the exchange and I asked for um, some more data, I wanted like two weeks of data, so it's just to see when the pattern began. And um, th they sent me those two weeks and it, but it was the same pattern. So it wasn't just three days, it was it was at least half a month. But that made sense because that was kind of like the fall of Lehman Brothers to that, you know, so okay. So I went, I said, okay, well, let's just go back another month, go back maybe to the beginning of September 08. 
um, or, or, or I think it went, I don't remember exactly, maybe it went into August, but I wanted to see just, okay, when did this start? Like, what was the trigger? Like, when did they start this pattern? Um, because I suspected it was maybe Lehman or, or something. But actually, when I went back a few months, it was the same pattern. When I went back, and then I thought I'm being super bold here. And I went back six <laughs> months. I was like, okay, April 08, October 08. Now I will find, how did this start? But actually, it was the same thing. A little bit less. I mean, some days they bought, they didn't buy 100% of the market volume every day. That's pretty hard to get every trade. But, um, but, but there were many days... Um, I think from the from the indictment, uh, there were tw I, these are rough numbers. Too. It was like twenty five or twenty seven days in the last year, where where the biggest bank was over seventy five percent of the volume on the exchange. But then, if you go down to like a fifty percent threshold, there were like maybe I don't have the numbers in front of me, but there were many many more days. And so they were always active in the market for their own shares. Um, and and when I went back to try to find when this began, I ended up having to go back to two thousand four. And it was basically, coincidentally, is right before I moved there that the behavior seemed to start. So for all the years I'd been living there, the, the banks had been kind of creating their own, own share price out of whole cloth. And as they grew, they crowded out everything else on, this, on the small stock exchange so that by the end, they were like 75% of the exchange market cap and probably more. Is, but, yeah. Well, so... the. <laughs> <laughs> the entire external face world facing message financial message the Icelandic stock exchange yeah we were looking at it we were seeing it rise yes we thought, all right well something good must be happening yes. the markets are telling us yeah that there is something good in the economy the future the economic outlook is bright yeah but all the way back to 2004 it was the banks themselves buying their own shares, propping up their own shares, inflating everyone's pensions, yep. right? regular people, yep. regular investments, convincing the outside world that things are going well. And of course, this was hap the, the executives at those banks, they were coming out very handsomely in this, right? Why were the banks doing this? Because from the top down, people were making money on this, yeah. And and it was that's how they were enriching themselves. Is is that accurate? That they were doing this for for the they they stole a bank. People got a hold of a bank, got into positions of power, and then they were using this bank to enrich themselves. Yeah, and then, am I overstating that? Uh, I think it's about that's about right. Um and and people um but but the people who really benefited from this w was not that many. You know, um, a lot of people in the banks were involved by the end I argue that that this became the business of the banks because once you when you spend um, in one financial quarter when you spend several hundred million on your own shares you have to then put those somewhere that was actually the, the next part of the mystery I don't know if we'll have time to get into that but but let's just, just go ahead let's just say that it took over every department in the bank in some way um, yeah so I mean uh they needed by the end of the quarter just like with Enron they needed to get their balance sheet squared up because they couldn't be sitting there with um, well there were, there were legal limits on how many of your own shares you could even hold and um, and they were well beyond those in, in, in many <laughs> many quarters but they needed to get that off the balance sheet by you know by the 31st of March or by the 30th of June each year so there was always a mat, just like at Enron, there was a mad scramble at the end of the quarter to, to, to jigger the accounts. And they needed, they basically needed someone to buy the shares from them. This um, is one of my favorite parts of the book, most <laughs> educational parts. So who is buying this yeah, at the end of the who, day? And so, where is that money coming from? Right. Unbelievable. So they needed, so in the early days, it was like friends and family or, or, I mean, by that I mean like or or like local Icelandic client you know like fishing companies and stuff even employees later but um, but 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 the volumes that they needed to dump were huge and they got bigger each quarter as the banks got in more and more trouble so um, they would in the end they would create these clients they would create companies offshore 
especially in the British Virgin Islands. Um, and that company... Cumpen- Cayman Islands, too. <laughs> I think there were some... In I have an islands. alibi. Um, I have an alibi for each of those days. <laughs> they, um, I'm not sure there were... Any, there must have been something in the Cayman, but I can't remember. Anyway, definitely BVI was big. Um, and Seychelles, I think. Anyway, um, but they would they would create these companies, and then the company would do a huge trade, the kind of trade that that were it legit, it would be in the FT. They did do a press release because it would be you know, some investor, you know, suddenly deciding to put two hundred million dollars mm-hmm. into an Icelandic bank by their equity. That's that's a big deal, right? But never announced, of course. Um, and um, uh, uh, yeah, so but where where would a new company <laughs> where would a new company get two hundred million? Um, to to do this trade at all, and then the, the answer is because it's a bank, they make loans. So <laughs> that <laughs> is the key. That's the key. That is the key. The often the, when we talk about this to the audience, it's just hard to understand that banks create the incomprehensibly overwhelming majority of money that's in the world, yeah. and they do it out of thin air. And this, your book, brought it home more than any other example I'm familiar with. Oh, that's great. Where did $200 million euros come from? Right, The bank wrote a loan to this brand new company. Well, it's a ledger balance. Yep. You now have $200 million, and you use that $200 million to buy our shares. Yep. And it just came out of thin air. And what a bonus. We get to put this loan down as an asset in our books. Everyone is happy. Everyone. Miracle everybody wins incredible incredible yep and so i mean they really innovated this i think it's it's pretty fascinating um but you know a few years of that uh because then of course those loans are not good loans right no i mean that in order to pay back wow. that loan that company's going to need to sell the shares and the shares are going to cr- crash if someone puts that many of them on the market so so that they had to keep that under the rug um uh, but but if and this this is I think the reason for the fast growth. If you can double your size every year, uh, you can outgrow the bad loans you, you made the year before. I mean, this is kind of a, a, a Ponzi around loans, right? So um, they were doing this uh, even as ba- as far back as '04. The quality of the loan book is getting worse and worse. There's a famous uh, WikiLeaks document from the early days of WikiLeaks. Which is the Quake Thing Bank loan book from from the summer of two thousand eight? You can still see it on there, and um, and you can just flip through those. It's a it, it's a slide deck. You can flip through these slides, and you can see that um, it's 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 a lot of loans against their own shares to companies that you've never heard of, and this is always misreported, e- even by academics, even in the press, as that as that. Um, the Icelandic banks shareholders took a lot of loans, but um, yeah, okay, you can say it that way, but that kind of gets it the wrong way around, I think. Um, you want to take a pause? Should we take a pause? Go ahead. No, no, okay. no. The lights okay. went out. We um, can't afford to pay for the. <clears throat> we're, we're not on a volcano. We're the energy street. <laughs> So um, uh, I think that, well, you might want to edit this part a little because I stopped when you oh, went in the dark. Okay. Oh, oh, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I think that gets it the wrong way around. When, when people say, oh, the, 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 the red flag was that the owners of the banks were, uh, were, were taking out too many loans. It's like, no, they created those owners out of thin air and gave them loans to be owners to hide the daily manipulation of the shares that, that they were doing uh, on the market. Um, and that's the part I want people to understand. Or one of the parts was, I want people to yeah. Yeah, in the last third of the book, the first two thirds, I suppose, is a story, narrative, excitement. There's a fabulous story of you saving some poor teenage girl from being grounded oh, yeah. in the, up in the deep <laughs> in north the West fjords, because there's yeah. a whiteout s- storm. <laughs> so there's delightful narrative stories all throughout there. Yeah. And the last third, it's more uh, ABC, what happened, mm-hmm. uh, how was it being done? Very informative. 
And so your investigations continued and there's some jarring moments. One of the most jarring for me was when you arrive at the bank because the bank is stone. One of the banks is stonewall. I guess they all were, but the first, the one I remember was you, they were stonewalling you and they'll say, yeah, sure. We'll respond to you. And it's been a couple of weeks. So you arrive there because you're, you're an American and you just show up. Whereas an Icelandic person would just continue sending voicemails or emails. You show up there and I found it so jarring that you arrive at this bank that is part of the reason why there's a, another Great Depression taking place in this country, a wipeout of savings, capital controls, mm -hmm. bankruptcies. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't be able to tell it no. when you walked into that bank. It no. looked glorious. They yeah. had waterfalls coming down yeah. the walls, yeah. marble, everything. And that was the first hint of what we would, the secret uh, of what was come as foreshadowing. You go on a... You go on a raid too yeah. uh, with a police officer that I'm imagining out of some crime oh, detective he's, he's novel. Fanta he's fantastic, that guy. Yeah, he is a he is out of a novel. He's yeah. drinking only coffee and <laughs> bourbon. That's the only thing he's <laughs> that powers him. No food needed. So fantastic stuff. Uh, and the momentum's building. You're doing good work. You're gathering data. You're you're identifying these crimes. Uh, and the momentum is gathering. You're getting more staff. Yeah, yeah. We've it's building. Yeah. You're only discovering just the big pieces. There's still a lot more to be oh, investigated. Yeah. Oh yeah. Do you want to tell people <laughs> the twist or the not? Twist. Should we? Because we have. I got more questions. Oh, we can. Because and then let's, let's, then the people. You yeah. Go ahead. What what do you want to? Where Let's, do you want to go? Let them discover the twist. We, you can go to the other questions, <laughs> maybe. Okay. <laughs> That's good, because we're told Iceland led the way. People went to jail, whereas in America and Britain, nobody went to jail. Everything's yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> Iceland did it right. Uh -huh. uh, okay. <laughs> we'll, leave it, we'll, we'll leave it at that. I have questions. I wrote down questions here about the central bank. I had a big question mark. That 500 million, was it euros? Euros. Or or dollars? Yeah. Where, how did that get approved? So many questions. Yeah, yeah. So many yeah. questions. Yeah. Uh, okay. We'll leave it at that. I do recommend, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, that you get the book to find out more. The issue with that central bank 500 million has never been satisfactorily explained to, 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 yeah. to, to today. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was looking at the, and so, okay, so now you're in Switzerland, you have, you're, I think at a new regulator, is that right? No, you're I have my pursuing own. Pursuing the work that. I have my own uh, consulting firm, so. Okay, so well, uh, they, when we finish the interview, you have to let everyone know, okay? Okay. What it is that you do, you yeah. have to advertise yeah. that. Um, let's go back to Iceland again. Earlier you mentioned a real estate boom in the early 2000s. Across the street from you in Basel, the Bank for International Settlements, they put out a early warning indicators for private credit. Okay. And they have five different measures. Too much credit too fast or debt servicing ratios that are too high. They do this by, by nations, cross-border claims of foreign banks lending into a country relative to GDP, household debt servicing ratios, and then they have a real residential property index. And they say, if, you're, if your real estate is booming, that's okay as long as you're on your national trend. So if your trend is crazy, if that's what you're used to, yeah, that's okay. You're, and you're still crazy, that's okay. Like Canada, Australia, for example. Right if that's what you're used to. But if you accelerate even off your trend, well, then they say, well, there's a there's a good chance. In fact, they put that chance at a 50% of a crisis, systemic banking crisis mm. within the next three years. Mm -hmm. In the last quarter, a number of countries, last available quarter, which was March, June, June 2022, a number of countries tripped that indicator. Canada for the first time, Australia oh, for the first time. Interesting. Booming past their bananas crazy trend. Yeah. Well above it. Mm -hmm. And now it's a warning. Hey, you've got too much credit coursing through your system. Mm -hmm. 
And guess which country I saw in there also tripping it for the <laughs> yeah. for the first time in probably the history of the data history. They only started collecting it in 2008, if I remember okay. correctly. Okay. Right. But now they've tripped it again. Iceland, mm. Iceland in the first quarter of 2022. Mm. I know we're not going to have the same thing happen that we've had it before, but we talked about earlier how it was the the pride of the people of Iceland. They they didn't look at this as their problem. It wasn't caused by Iceland. It was the global financial crisis. It was yeah. America's mortgage-backed securities right, right, that caused this. Right. When you were splitting the banks into a good bank and a bad bank, mm. it wasn't good assets and bad assets. It was Icelandic assets, which... Which are good, always good because they're in Iceland, yes. <laughs> and bad assets, which are the foreigners, those right. dirty foreigners. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got. Is, I, we're not going to have. I got called the. Di- is it happening again? I was going to say I got. Are we having a boom again. I got oh. called a dirty foreigner there a few times, but anyway, <laughs> um, um, I really worry for Iceland because um, I don't think I think that I think the same people in a lot of cases are still in the same positions or their protégés are in the positions. And I think the reckoning for, um, you know, Iceland got nice headlines because there were some prosecutions um, and and there should have been more, but there were some. And um, and I think that was a sort of a balm. But and the other thing is that the prosecutions, these, these cases are complicated. Even in the US, I think the average SEC case takes about five years. Hmm. I, I don't know where I read that. That may not be true, but I think that's what I read. Um, you know, and these cases took about five years. And by that point, the country was in a different place. Um, the dark, the darkest years was probably two or three or four years after the crisis. But by about 2012, 13, 14, things were getting better. I guess the cases took a little longer. The first indictments were in 13? Some of the cases were, but you know, these guys, uh, they're defense lawyers. They used every procedural trick in the book to try to keep, to try to delay and delay and delay. But the final verdicts from the, and then they appealed everything to the Icelandic Supreme Court. They appealed, as Iceland only had two levels of court. They had the district courts and the Supreme Court. And these guys appealed so much stuff that it, it necessitated, Iceland created a mid-level appeals court actually, just because hmm. of so everything was going to the Supreme Court, all of these cases. And the Supreme Court almost universally f- found these people guilty. Um, in m- many cases, it made the penalties harsher than what the district court had set. I love that. But that was still the penalties were, interesting. were not very extensive, as you saw. I mean, and it's the same in many countries. If you, if you get a five-year prison sentence for a white-collar crime, you probably... Don't, maybe you serve a year, maybe not even. And uh, that, I rarely serve out my sentence. Right, right. I haven't even reported for mine. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were there were several of these cases or instances were appealed even further to the European Court of what of was human, it? Rights. human rights yeah, or something. Yeah. So even more appeals that yeah, were then yeah. complicating the whole mess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forever. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, Iceland's. You would, when we look at Iceland, we think it has recovered. Yeah. But, but has it? You made the point here that it, the country has been irrevocably changed, and and you feel that it's not for the better. That. It's well, the hollower. I'm nostalgic for the Iceland that I moved to, and that's probably just my own attachment to that. But um, the tourist volumes, at least pre-COVID, and I think they're coming back to that now, maybe. But pre-COVID, Iceland had one. Iceland had ten tourists per year for every man, woman, and child in the country. Ten to one, and that has changed the character of the um, of this of Reykjavik, which is our only kind of city. Um, so I I'm just nostalgic for the Reykjavik that I miss. Some of my Icelandic friends say, "Yeah, but look, we have so many more people here in the city now because of tourism." that um, restaurants can be open longer. You know, there's more for us to do because of the tourists. But but uh, I went into a store on my last visit there on Reykjavik, which is the main street in Reykjavik, 
I went to a store. I said, go and die and, you know, good day. And I started uh, asking the person something and the guy didn't speak Icelandic because they even had to import workers for the for the stores from, from other European countries because the, to handle the tourist volumes, the country can't handle um, with the existing population, can't handle those those volumes. So, yeah, the country has, you know, when your currency loses half its value, it becomes attractive to tourists to 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 come there. The currency has never recovered its value, its levels of um, of, of the early two thousands. Uh, it's still stuck at at those lower um, exchange rates versus the dollar and euro and stuff. So I think yeah, the country was able to rebuild on the back of tourism. But my personal opinion is for a place with a with a long history of democracy and a very well educated population, it can do better than tourism as its main industry and should do better. Um, but I don't live there anymore. So I can't, you know, I feel a little bit hypocritical about that. But, uh, but, but I, I feel very sad about it. Yes. Yeah, so when I was there, I was trying to be my nicest because I was reading your book and I was reading those sentiments and wanted to express my gratitude to the people I was there and mm -hmm. not seem like a burden <laughs> right. to people there and not disrespecting the culture. So I did my best. Yeah. I did take off all my clothes before entering the pools and did wash myself thoroughly well, for that's just, the audience. You've got to do that. Yeah, you've got to. Yeah. You've got to Cause don't bother entering any of those pools no, without getting fully naked. There's no chlorine before you enter the pool. Yeah, you gotta just shower. You gotta yeah get clean because there's no chlorine. It's just natural water. So, yeah. Uh, okay. There's a lot more in the book, but is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to bring to the audience's attention? If not, can you tell us what you're doing now? What you see about the, what you think about the future? Any, any final thoughts that you want? Sure. I, I think um, uh, some people misinterpret the book uh, because they just see it as a tale about Iceland. So uh, someone I went to MIT with, he wrote me a nice email and he said, um, hey, I really loved your book. Um, it, it's a shame about those Icelanders. When will they get it together? <laughs> and I wrote him back and I said, look, I never would write a book to pick on my adopted adopted homeland. Um, uh, I, I, the book is a cautionary tale for, for me and I think that the systems and the patterns that you see in there are also the story of our financial system like writ large and the the, 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 the conflicts of interest and the, like the bad incentives for regulators the fact that if, if you're a regulator in almost any country and someone comes to you with a $5 billion fraud and, and you want to go after that you're probably going to lose your job for that um, you know, the regulators are not set up for this. They're not set up to go after big crime. They don't even look for it in many cases. They, they go after smaller things. They fine and da-da-da. I mean, they do something. But when it comes to a huge scam on this level, which I'm convinced there are others running somewhere, um, they're, they're not set up for that. So I think that's the message I would like people to take away is uh, how does this apply to where I live? Um, and yeah, now we have the have the uh, noontime bells here in Bern. Um, and as far as what I'm doing now, I have uh, I have my own firm, Skatla. It's a Swiss uh, company. And I've been doing consulting um, uh, on investigations like this. But also I've been doing a lot of work recently on sustainable finance. And actually, there is a connection there because I think that's, that's the next... Um, <laughs> that's going to mm -hmm. be the next place. For, you know, and people are already talking about greenwashing. But this is the next place where uh, where you can do massive frauds, I think, because there's in Europe anyway. There's so much demand for like sustainable investment products. People don't want to buy bad companies; they want to do good with their money, and so on. And so, the temptation there to just slap a green label and everything is is so great. And so, I think this is a, this is uh, another brave new frontier of of um, financial market scams potentially, but also. It's a, if, if done right, it could be transformational for the world. We need to transform the financial system to get a, a cleaner world. And, and, and this is also how I end Iceland's secret. How can we expect to have clean air when we, when we don't have uh, clean running financial markets, which we, we patently don't? So I would leave you with that message. It w yes, a little depressing, but... 
Well, it was informative, educational. Yeah, go ahead, Jared. Well, I don't want to be depressing, I guess, because uh, I see it as a problem that's easily solved. But it takes... Human character, yeah. though, that's the problem. Yeah, I mean, human nature stands in the way. <laughs> well, but human nature also stands in the way. Uh, so, um, why do we have such a safe aviation system, but it's humans flying the plane? It's because we have the right procedures, we have the right checks. We take that seriously. When it, when a plane crash happens, people go and investigate. Why did this happen? You know, they grounded the the um, 737 MAX for like a year, right? And and rightly so. Um, but nothing like that happens in finance. Nothing. And So optimistic then. we need, It's the people that need to uh, demand the change, right? It's yeah. not that the leaders, yeah. it's not for us to look to the leaders who are likely intertwined yeah. with what is happening and enjoying the financial benefits of a loose and shadowy system. It's the people who need to be yeah. outraged. Pe people were out will they be? People were outraged in Iceland and came out on the streets all winter in that dark winter. They were there all day from early in the morning until till night outside the parliament building, banging on pots and pans, lighting fires. I mean, it was it was a bit crazy, but there were always someone there. Um, and that's the kind of energy that we needed. It, it, it could happen anywhere. Um, but I, I, but the negative part maybe is like it's going to take an Iceland-style collapse in the bigger countries before people wake up to how much the financial system affects them. They think people think it doesn't affect them, but it actually it affects their ability to buy milk at the store. You know, it's 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 intertwined with the payment system, and it's it's a part of daily life that is quite corrupt. But people are taking it for granted, um, and th that's kind of the message I want to get on. It's cyclical in nature. Right, because we are exiting the laissez-faire era of the mm -hmm. 80s, the Thatcher, mm -hmm. Reagan, mm -hmm. which itself was a reaction to the capital controls and financial repression that came in after the Second World right, War. Right. So it's a natural, natural pendulum swing. Yep. We've reached the end of that yep. laissez-faire economic system. And I'm sure, unfortunately, we're going to come into another crisis, a devastating yep, crisis yep. that will create another pots and pans revolution, another Occupy Wall Street. Right. And this time the leaders will feel that it's in their electoral interest to pursue these cases and implement stringent regul not even regulations, like, but no. just change just yeah, not not new regulations. It's enforcement. Yeah. And uh, and that'll last for a generation. Then it will start swinging the pendulum the other way, Pro which is fine. We're probably so. Humans. Yeah, yeah. Probably so. Yeah. Jared, it was a real pleasure. I hope to see you in Switzerland one day, and come and shake your hand, enjoy, a co share a coffee together, or something. Would be lovely. I love the book. Thank you for writing it. And I'm worried that one day you're gonna have uh, part two, another country, another story, maybe. Green, green secret, <laughs> something like that. The ESG secret. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Thanks very much. It Thank was a pleasure. Much, Jerry. Thanks for having me on. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again to Jared Bibler, the author of Iceland Secret, a great book that I read while I was in Iceland, thoroughly enjoyed it, learned a tremendous amount. There were scenes where the banks were creating money out of thin air to buy their own shares, and it brought home all those lessons I had learned at the feet of the great Eurodollar master himself, Jeff Snyder that banks have the ability to create money out of thin air. This book brings it home. That that 2014 Bank of England uh, working paper, I think it was just a quarterly newsletter where they explained that no, the Bank of England doesn't create the vast majority of money that's in circulation in the nation. It's the private system. You see it here in this book. The banks were creating money just out of whimsical thin air to buy their own shares and of course in other countries they do it for loans that are perhaps a little bit more palatable perhaps a little bit more economically justifiable but the point is we can see how easy it is 
and it and it puts the Federal Reserve and other central banks who quote unquote print money to shame central banks, the public institutions have nothing on the private sector when it comes to wanton money printing. Great book. Again, check the show notes. You'll find out where you can buy the book. You'll find out more about Jared. You'll find out about his company. Great stuff. I really enjoyed it. Which brings me to the fact that I really enjoyed doing this interview. I have done interviews before, but that was a long time ago. Deep into the mists of time of September 2022. So much time has elapsed. Last I talked to you, I was on the Euro Dollar show with Jeff Snyder, who continues to do the show, to which I listen to every single week and day. And it's a wonderful show, and I love it, and it's still fabulous. But I'm no longer on that show. I've taken a sabbatical, a somewhat indefinite sabbatical that will last, gosh, well, indefinitely. I don't really know how long. And the reason why many people on Twitter have theorized and speculated as to why. Some people have said, well, it's because the Federal Reserve has bought off Emil for 10,000 in bank reserves. And that's true. Yeah, they bought me off, but that's not why I left the show. Other people have speculated that Emil is the target of a class action paternity suit that has been filed in a number of Southeast Asian jurisdictions. And again, true, true, but that's not why I left the show. Is it because of the cars, the drugs, the women and the clubs? Yes, all of that is a problem. Yes, uh, but not why I left the show. The reason I left the show is I simply, oh, it's so pedestrian. It's so blase. I hate to even reveal it to all of you. I wish I could continue the charade that I just got caught up in some backgammon game and I'm in deep to a bunch of seedy characters and I had to go on the limb, which is also true. But the reason why is I simply had too many jobs. All the jobs I have, I love. I have five jobs. I did have five jobs. I love them all, but they it was too much. I was starting to do a bad job in all of them and it was just simply too much and i had to resign from one of the jobs that i love and that was that was the euro dollar university show sad sad i miss all of you but the good news is that the universe and fate surely won't allow me to ride off into the sunset happily enjoying my other four jobs what they will do now is they've been lying in wait, and as soon as I've cut ties with Eurodollar University land, what will they do? They will fire me from the other four jobs. I will lose the other four jobs, and then I will come crawling back to you, dear audience, on my hands and knees through the black sands of the beaches of Iceland and the white sands of Seven Mile Beach of the Cayman Islands, and I will come begging to you. I will have kelp attached to me. I'll be sunburnt and I'll look up to you and I'll say, please, please, can I come back? And do you have perhaps a nice uh, drink of rum too? I'm very thirsty. I'm parched. I had to swim through that entire sea, salty ocean. Please let me come back. And you'll say, man. Well, I look forward to the day of earning back your trust. I think the autumn of 2023 looks more promising. Anyhow, I miss all of you. I had a great time. In case I read, <laughs> in case I read other things and uh, they are of interest in macroeconomic realms, I'll interview the authors and I'll bring it to you. And in the meantime, I wish you the very best. Again, I see I'm looking out across uh, my windows here. I'm looking out over the landscape and I see that the financial apocalypse is upon us once again. And so I wish all of you the very best as we enter another economic Armageddon. These things just keep coming back all the time. So I hope for those of us that do survive, I hope to talk to you again one day in the not too distant future. In the meantime, please tune in to Jeff Snyder's Euro Dollar University. And of course, he's got the Euro Dollar University member site. It's fantastic. It's the best. 
I miss you all. Take care. Talk to you soon. And get Jared Bibler's book. Great. Highly recommended.